This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. We welcome you again to our ongoing series of roundtable discussions on the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels of the New Testament. And joining us are members of the BYU Religious Education faculty. I'm Brent Topp, Associate Dean of Religious Education and Professor of Church History and Doctrine. And joining me today are Professor Camille Franck, Professor Ray Huntington, and Professor David Whitchurch. All three of these good faculty members are from the Department of Ancient Scripture. Well, let's continue talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we pretty well talked about the thesis and those major points, the difference between behaving and being, the difference between living the external law, which we, he characterized as the lesser law, the law of Moses, and living the higher law, where righteousness is not so much just what you do on the outside, but what you are on the inside. Let's deal with one of the most important passages in the entire Sermon on the Mount that I think becomes a bridge or a segue between the chapters, and that's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Notice he says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now this is a beautiful passage, but sometimes I think it is grossly misunderstood by us as members of the church and the world in general and sometimes we put more emphasis on our striving to be perfect than what Jesus is trying to teach us here. What do we really know Jesus is trying to say in verse 48 there? How do we achieve that state of perfection? I, th I think we need to add to that as we talk about this notion of perfection that Joseph Smith provides just a slight addition at the beginning of it to talk about its importance. He says, ye are therefore commanded to be perfect. Well, thanks. I even feel which, worse which, now. <laughs> which does the very thing that you're, we're, we're talking about. Is we sometimes look at this and say, how in the world can I live a perfect life? It, yeah. It's one of self-condemnation. It's one of, of absolute despair that there's no possible way that I can become as the, uh, as the Gospel of Matthew or the Savior is mm -hmm. teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. But that's the very idea, is that we are commanded to become... The, the word perfect is probably better um, understood as to become mature or complete. ripe or complete. Mm -hmm. Or finished. Yeah, yeah finished finish is another way of saying see, it. See, I this, like this the idea ripe becoming. idea because you can see a fruit in the springtime that is anything but ripe, mm -hmm. but you don't say it's rotten or worthless. Mm -hmm. It needs time and right circumstances of development. Or even when it's fully formed but not yet ripe. Yes. That's another image of it. And, and, and I think the nourishment that you have to take from all this is the Savior, that it's the process by which we utilize the atonement in our life, we come unto Christ, that we really become perfect. We need to remind ourselves, as the Book of Mormon does in Second Nephi chapter 25, verse 23, that, that we're saved by grace. After all, we can do. We, there are responsibilities, obviously, that we have, uh, that we need to be doing, but at the same time, um, as we talk about the Sermon on the Mount and, the, and this idea of, of here are behavioral standards set forth by the Law of Moses, the higher law um, then teaches that there's something happening within a person that, that supersedes these behavioral laws. That, that, that whatever it is that's happening with, within a person, um, it, it's having a new heart. It's, it's um, letting that old man be crucified. Um, and becoming anew, as Paul talks, it, it's, it's coming through the atonement of Christ. In it's fact, through His grace. Absolutely. You, you, you mentioned Second Nephi 25, but the Book of Mormon, I think, even gives us an even greater understanding of Matthew 5.48 when we go to Third Nephi 12. What do we see as different in the Savior's account in Third Nephi 12, verse 48, sure. when he's giving the same, almost the same sermon that he gave at the Sermon on the Mount to the Nephite 12 and the Nephite disciples, what does that help us to understand about verse 48 in Matthew 5? 
be, be therefore perfect even as I mm -hmm. and my Father in heaven is perfect. Which but, means, as Elder Nelson direction. pointed out, was even Jesus, who was perfect in the sinless sense, was not perfect in the finished sense until after he was resurrected. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're absolutely right, is that that perfect there doesn't mean never making a mistake. It doesn't mean that we take the Sermon on the Mount and everything Jesus taught as a checklist and put it up there and we check it off. I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, I must be perfect. It's really saying, if I do that part, then Christ makes me perfect and I won't be fully complete until after I'm resurrected. And that's a lifetime process. Mm -hmm. it's not and beyond. going to take place in two weeks. And I think when we're filled with the Spirit, as the Beatitudes teach us how we can become, we see that more clearly. Right. Without that, the focus is much more on us. Remember the rich young ruler who said, what do I need to do to have mm -hmm. eternal life? Right. And the Lord responded with commandments. And I think the next part, we don't know, we see. He then says, which, you know, keep the commandments. Yeah. And then he says, which? Which, which one? Well, I've got to do my little checklist. Thing, I've got to do my check. Thing. And, mm -hmm. and we miss the point of something far greater of what we yeah. do with the Spirit. We can become exactly what He's commanded. I think a really good cross-reference to put to Matthew 5, 48, in addition to the third Nephi 12, 48, is Moroni chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, where, where Moroni says to us, Come unto Christ and be perfected in Him. Yeah. And so, you know, Ray, you mentioned we are saved by grace after all we can do. I think sometimes we look at this passage and we look at that same concept and we think we're saved by grace after all we can do when in reality Jesus is saying you do the best you can in becoming a disciple. Yeah. You, you know, as I, as, and then I'll make you perfect. As we've talked about this, um, it comes to mind that really what we're talking about here, we've talked about changing our hearts, mm -hmm. but also it becomes a matter of submitting our will to the will of the Father in everything that we do, right. whatever our vocations in life, whatever we're doing, that we submit our will to the will of the Father. And as we're willing to do that, it doesn't become a checklist anymore. It becomes a lifestyle. It becomes, where are we? Excellent. Are and, we I, and I think as we now use that as a springboard into chapter 6, I think we can see that that perfection that comes through Christ is not just a checklist or a, a series of steps, but that it takes the whole soul. Because now look at, look at how Matthew 6 starts out. I find that interesting that Jesus says, take heed as, as a warning right out of the chute about something. And not only is he just warning us about it, but I think the warning is that it's the natural man. All of the things that he's going to take heed of are the very epitome of the natural man. And so let's look at what he's saying that we ought to be careful about that personify not just outward actions but inward discipleship. I, I just, again, as we get into this, uh, Joseph Smith reminds us once again who our audience is as we start off chapter 6. And it came to pass that as Jesus taught his disciples, he mm -hmm. said unto them, yeah. And he moves right into it. Take you've got to be to different. That. That's right. You've got to be different from others. Mm -hmm. We're not just talking activity in the church. We're talking real, genuine righteousness. Well, and it's just that righteousness that, that is that inward. Um, it's not behavior. Mm -hmm. Behavior is seen, but, it, but it's a result of what's within a person. Mm -hmm. And but that's has, what he's talking about here. It has to include here. the behavior. Right. Certainly. Mm -hmm. You've got to walk the walk and mm -hmm. talk the talk. He well, what, doesn't say don't give alms. No. He says when thou doest alms. What do we mean by let alms? Let not thy right hand. An alms is a charitable benefit given to someone else. In our it could day, be what anything. would it be? Well, it could be tithing, a fast offering. It could be an act right. of right. kindness to right. your neighbor. Right. Sure. Okay, well, let's look at them. Let's look at some of the things that he mentions there, and then let's see what do they all have in common, and what is it that Jesus is trying to teach us. Okay, so there's the alms. Don't do as the hypocrites and, and sound the trumpet. Uh, when you're paying, paying your alms, to the prayers, wh don't be as the hypocrites that do what? They love to, they love to stand <laughs> in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, um, and, and that's where they offer their prayers. Okay, but, and then but, the, really, but really it's so that they can be seen of men. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And also they might have these nice flowery phrases that would just sound, oh, that's a wonderful prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Judaism taught their people to pray morning, noon, and night, re irregardless of where you were at. Mm -hmm. if, it's, uh, if, if it's the noon sacrifice at the temple, that's the time to say your noon prayers. And if the, if the, uh, if the Pharisees or scribes were in the marketplace, they would stop dead still 
And they would begin offering those prayers, and they, they, they were vocal prayers. People could hear them, hear mm -hmm. them and see them, and there would be motion attached to them. And the louder, the more passionate, the and the more eloquent, <laughs> the more righteous you the were supposedly righteous. viewed. Exactly. Can I just, okay? this, just a real quick, I know we don't have a lot of time for this, but I remember hearing President Kimball. Um, it was a, t a story told of him when he was invited to pray before Congress. Congress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after the prayer, the man who had invited him thanked him for that beautiful prayer and apologized because there weren't many well, in attendance. Well, we all see that. If you watch C-SPAN, you see all the <laughs> empty chairs there. So. And after yeah. saying, oh, there, that was a beautiful prayer. I'm sorry there weren't more here. And President Kimball's response was just instantaneous. Oh, you don't need to apologize. I wasn't praying to them. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that focus, that the prayer is to, to the Father. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a voice for all those who were in attendance. But Well, and then closely related to that, the third behavior or concern that the Savior is having is have to do with fasting. Well, what's he upset with about fasting? Fasting is to bring spiritual strength. What's he upset about? You know, everything that we look at in chapter 6 it has to do with horizontal relationships. Why do we do what we do and is it to impress our neighbor or is it because we worship God? Ah. Now, isn't it interesting, he, the Savior uses a term for the people that do the things that he's cautioned against. And what is it? Hypocrite. Hypocrite. Now, this is something in English we don't pay particular attention to, but the Greek root for that is so significant. What was a hypocrite in ancient Greece? It was an actor. It's one who, who, Plays a who part. played a part. Mm -hmm. They put a, a, role. a mask in front and, and they had a role. They had a they had a set of lines they memorized and they, they, they went through the motions. Now, recited. isn't that, that to me even makes the passage more beautiful because what he's saying is what you're doing is putting up a mask of religious life. Right. But it's not really you. You're playing a role exactly. of someone that is righteous in the play, but you, deep inside, you're not that way. What does this mean to us, though? I mean, it's easy to look back at the scribes and the Pharisees and see the cultural context and see, well, now you know why Jesus is blasting them, if you want to use that term. What's he really saying to true disciples and how does it apply to us in the 21st century? As I read chapter 6, I can get fatigued really quickly. This takes a lot of energy to put on the appearance mm -hmm. and there's nothing that feeds in return. I think when, if we really believe this, it means we put their faith and trust in the Lord. We do what he's asked independent of what other people may think. And there's a power that is given to us that far exceeds anything that we can do on our own. When we do the things he's warning about in chapter 6, we deny Christ's power and his atonement. We want to compensate it thinking mm -hmm. we have to superimpose us on top of it. And there is a depletion of energy. There's a depletion of power when we do that. And the other way, we're actually infused with it. We're able to do then whatever he's asked us and say whatever he asks yeah. us and become. That the, the power is in being the real person, right. not wearing That's the mask. Right. You know, we talk about coming unto the, into the rest of the Lord. Yes. And if, if we're involved in this church, we don't rest very much. But if we're living the gospel, we're at complete rest. Yeah. Our conscience peace. is yeah. peace. Mm -hmm. peace. Well, I think in verse 33, it's sort of summed up. Uh, in chapter 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That goes back to what Camille was saying. Um, and, 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 and seeking the kingdom and then at His righteousness. Yeah. This, this um, we talk about, oh, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we need to do our part, but it's God that makes us righteous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I we think, need to trust in Him. Right. And I think that what we're seeing here in this sermon is that he wants us to have right actions, but he also, more than right actions, he wants us to have right hearts. Right. And if the hearts are right, right. the actions will always right. follow. Because exactly. he can change your heart. That's right. You bet he will. What do you think he means in verse 24 about mammon? And how is that related to the alms and the prayers and the fasting and all of that that we see in chapter 6? M mammon is an Aramaic word that means earthly goods. Usually has reference to riches, wealth and it becomes a matter of choosing. You can't, in fact, verse 33, the one that uh, Ray just brought up, if you look at what Joseph Smith says, verse 33, uh, the authorized version in King James, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Joseph Smith provides the insight, wherefore seek not the things of this world, 
uh, you, you can't have the things of this world and mammon uh, and the things of God. Uh, uh, not in the sense that uh, certainly we need things of this world. Right. But if that's where our heart is, we're going to he find says ourselves. To love God first, and if you love God first, you can't love riches first. Yeah. And and I like that. No man can serve two masters. It's talking about loyalties. Where, where is your heart? The emphasis in this chapter is on the heart, which represented your desires, your, your priorities, your motivations. You know, there's an Old Testament passage from the psalmist that I think of that I think capsulizes Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6 on who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, but he that hath clean hands, that's the higher actions of righteousness, and he that hath the pure heart. Um, well, that's, I want you to... Uh, as we look at this part, as we now go over to chapter 7, um, we've, we've hit those main points in chapter 6 to focus on um, the heart, the motivations, the why we do what we do. As Brother Whitchurch pointed out, is it, is it to impress other people or are we doing it for the righteousness of God? Are we, are we seeking our own glory? Are we seeking the, the glory of God? Uh, that reminds me real quickly before we jump to chapter 7. You'll remember a very popular uh, commercial that's been on television of a very popular sports figure that was advertising a, a product and the, the whole theme was image is everything. You remember that one? Mm -hmm. And I think that is showing just the, the very thing that Jesus is saying there is don't seek the things of the world. To the world, image is everything. To Jesus, image is nothing. Righteousness. Is God's everything. Image in God's our image in our countenance. Excellent mm -hmm. way of saying it. God's image in our countenance is everything, but our image yeah. is nothing. Let's go to chapter 7. Right out of the chute there in chapter 7 is one of the most misunderstood passages and oft cited passages by teenage children in the church. <laughs> I mean, every parent has probably had a teenage child uh, bounce this one off us. Uh, what do they usually want that passage to say, and what is it that Jesus is really saying when he says, judge not? What is it that our teenage kids often want us to interpret that to mean? Oh, mom and dad, don't be so judgmental. Yeah. You know, back off. You can't make a, no. a judgment on that. You can't assess the situation. Don't be call that a sin. That's right. Tolerate everything. <laughs> Well, what in the world is Jesus teaching us then if that's, the, if that's the mistranslation or the misinterpretation? You know, we have to judge. There's no way to escape it. Uh, Book of Mormon makes that very clear in Moroni chapter 7 that we need to judge, but we need to do it righteously. And in this case, the Joseph Smith translation makes the change uh, at the bottom in which he says that um, to, to judge not unrighteously. Uh, our judgments need to be... Uh, uh, made uh, based on spirit mm -hmm. and, and uh, based on discipleship here. We need to judge differently than the world judges. Mm -hmm. you know, we even, need to even, see differently. Even the original language out of the Greek, as I understand it, condemn not, that you be not condemned. Yeah, it meant a final, uh, right. like an execution, mm -hmm. condemning someone to execution or sentencing, sentencing them to life in prison. It wasn't a... Uh, it's not a discernment, it's not an assessment, it is a condemnation in that way. And it way. doesn't allow for the atonement to work in another's right. life, to be able to return. It's a, more of a finality. So when he says, judge not unrighteous judgment, he's saying, don't make your harsh judgments. Remember recently in the Ensign, uh, Elder Oaks gave yeah. that uh, great classic. talk in the classic address that there's a difference between intermediate judgments and final mm -hmm. judgments. And as Brother Huntington pointed out, we're making intermediate judgments all the time, every day. And, and, and we're given, as he pointed out, from the Book of Mormon, the way to do that. That's right. Those things that bring us closer to Christ, we would judge to be good. And those that take us away from him, we would judge to be bad, and we need to. And we want our young men and young women who are using this scripture to say, well, don't judge. Well, wait a second. You need to make judgments mm -hmm. your life both spiritual and physical, may be dependent upon your right. judgments. You know, part of it is you keep reading. He talks about the mote and the beam, the, okay. the little speck in our own eye uh, <laughs> that we often, or the speck that we see in somebody else, and we often have a beam, literally a yeah. beam from a building that's in our own eye that gets in the way. And, you know, it's the glasses that we wear that I think he's cautioning us 
that we need to look through the glasses of the gospel, that we need to have mercy, that we need to understand what the Savior's done for us and then treat people in accordance yeah. with that. I love the imagery that he's creating there. This is a great example of Jesus' use of hyperbole, of using mm -hmm. such extreme exaggerations so that you can't misunderstand what he's trying to say. And so the speck, as I, the, the mode as I understand it, is almost imperceptible. imperceptible. <laughs> it's like when we get a little piece of dust in our eye that is so irritating, but you can't find it anywhere. And the beam the, the, is truly like a construction beam. Mm -hmm. I just think of the humor as well as the power of what Jesus is saying is, can you imagine if you were to do it in a cartoon caricature, someone that has a big steel girder construction beam stuck in their <laughs> eye and trying to point out someone else's little speck, the, that, the hypocrisy, flaw. an imperceptible flaw. But we do have to make judgments in this regard. Um, in chapter 7, I think uh, we also need to, to look a little bit at some of the things, that, the, the cautions that Jesus gives as well. Um, I think one of the things in verse 15 is an important verse that we ought to look at is this beware of false prophets and the wolf in sheep's clothing. What is Jesus saying to the disciples and what application does it have for us today as well? Just because you see someone in a white shirt and tie doesn't uh -oh. mean you can trust everything that they are saying. You have you a white shirt that... on. <laughs> no, it's off white. It is off. <laughs> a little tainted. <laughs> well, it's true. In another place, Jesus talks about um, warning against judging by appearances as mm -hmm. well. Uh, the, that spirit is needed to be able to make those righteous judgments. And a lot of times we need to, to depend on that instead of simply some outward credential. You know, I think one of the things that the Savior is doing, Brent, uh, this, this is, he's concluding this wonderful sermon. And, it, and it's given um, as, as caution. Um, what, what, what he's done so far in chapters 5 and 6 and, and most of 7 is to lay out a, a pathway for disciples to follow. It's that pathway of discipleship, that behavior versus the, uh, the, the inward feeling or, or um, values that, that we obtain. And I think there, there are going to be uh, alternate sources presented to people. Um, yeah, that's one way to go, but, but, but look at this way over here. And, and when you examine the second half of the New Testament, you find the battle that Paul is fighting continually, continuously is with alternate pathways that have been presented by false teachers. Mm -hmm. and, and he's warning them here, uh, you need to be aware of these false prophets. They're going to come to you in sheep's clothing, maybe mm -hmm. within the membership of the church, right. well, teaching doctrine that shouldn't Smith be taught. Joseph Matthew tells us the elect according to the covenant, right. if, exactly. if possible. So. You notice how it, it says they come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves, mm -hmm. ferocious, ferocious, just mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. intense so on tell? destroying. You've got the spirit and you've got fruits. Right. And you've got not everyone that saith unto me, Lord. It's not just what we profess. It's not how glorious we can speak, but what we actually do. He yeah. that doeth the will of my Father. Well, in fact, there's more than just doing. I think we go one step further in, in what Camille just brought up in verses 21 through 23 there because he's using that as a way to judge. He says, many will come to me saying, have we not mm -hmm. prophesied in thy name? Have we not done mighty miracles? Maybe we could change that and say, have we not done great works? Have we not served in leadership capacities? Have we not had important callings in the kingdom? And you remember the JST changes his response to, you never you knew me, me, which I think brings it back to this whole concept of real righteousness is not just doing or being active or holding callings, but knowing Christ. Right. Coming yeah. to know the Savior in a very personal and profound and way. And how did John teach? How do we know that we know him? If we keep his commandments. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and Jesus offers some more counsel in chapter 7. You go back to verse 7. Ask, it'll be given you. Seek, you'll find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. For why everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. It's the same concept as the first chapter of James. If, you, if any man needs wisdom, let him ask of God. He doesn't upbraid. Uh, if we know how to judge, we can find, if we need to know how to judge, if we need to, to, to discern between good and evil in people, 
um, the, the key is seeking Heavenly Father mm -hmm. and His guidance. Uh, it makes it really clear. Um, God is, is like this good father that if a son asks for a piece of bread, he's not going to give him a stone. Mm -hmm. If he asks for a fish, he's not going to give him a snake or a serpent. Mm -hmm. God is the giver of all good things. Mm -hmm. And for us who need wisdom to, to be able to, to judge wisely and righteously, God, you know, God can direct our hearts. I think that's great. And, and in fact, if we were to bring it to a, to a conclusion, as to a real nutshell, I think one of the things that we see from this great Sermon on the Mount is the guarantee that he gives us there at the end of chapter 7 that is even elaborated further in the Book of Mormon in Helaman that if we're built truly upon the rock foundation of Christ, we will not fall. We cannot fall. Yeah, we cannot. And no matter what happens, but if we are doing things for the outward reasons, if we are just behaving but not being, we're on sand. But when we are on the foundation, the rock-solid foundation of Jesus Christ, true disciples, inward and outward, we cannot fall. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu. This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.